Stand together, please, as we pray. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to consider the body of Christ here at Downsview Baptist Church. Body of a collection of blood-bought believers. Those who have, by your grace, come into your family and have come this day, dear God, to gather together, to assemble as your word encourages us again and again to do, that we might bring praise and glory to our King in the context of our local church community. We bless you for this privilege, for the freedom that you give us in this country to do so. Now we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we ask your spirit to be the one who is our teacher, to be the one who is the motivator, to be the one who points us to the word, which itself is the fuel for our worship. We pray to your God that you would be honored in this place. You who have brought clarity out of the confusion of this world. You who have brought life when there was only death in our lives. You, Heavenly Father, who's the one who's brought grace when we are so determined to try to do it ourselves. You who bestowed mercy on us far more than we deserve. Hear our prayer, dear God, that you might honor Christ in our midst, we pray in his name. Amen. And so to all who are weary and who need rest, to all who mourn and who long for comfort, to all who are weak and who are frail and who desire strength, perhaps to all who feel worthless, a wonder if God even cares, and to all who sin, and need a savior, Downsview Baptist Church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus. The mighty friend of sinners, the ally of his enemies, and the defender of the indefensible, and the justifier of those who just have no excuses left. In Jesus' name, welcome. Please remain standing as we hear the word of God read. Our call to worship this morning is from Ephesians. This is a potential book. It's a book of doctrine, and this passage I'm going to read is outstanding. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, starting at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant, to, grant you to be strengthened with power through the spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may strength have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and to know, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even think according to the power at work within us. To him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. It is truly such an inspired, inspirational passage that the love of God surpasses and far exceeds any knowledge we might have, any power we might even imagine, any sort of thing. The worst monster or our worst fear made manifest, God is so much stronger. He is all powerful and he is our God. And we know that in Christ alone, we can fully trust him with all things. Um, and so that is the first song we will sing today. <clears throat> Solid ground. 
next song we will sing is Blessed Assurance. <clears throat> bless you for such wonderful truths you give us to sing to affirm and confirm again and again we thank you dear god for the assurance of our salvation which is not assured because of us but because of the one who has saved us the one to whom we look the one to whom we direct our praise we pray that he would be honored in our midst this day for his sake we pray amen let's take a minute to greet one another in the name of the lord this morning You know, it's a glorious thing, as the Bible says, for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Part of that dwelling is worshiping together. Part of that is fellowshipping together. But part of that happens when we're in a place like this. And it's very good when you can hear what I'm saying. <laughs> it's very good when the microphones work and the, the words that are to be up on the screen are the words that are supposed to be there. 
when things are supposed to work that way, um, it's wonderful. The reality, as you well know, is that sometimes those things don't always work. And you know how to help, right? If the soundboard doesn't work, what do you do? You all look back, right? Because they probably don't realize that something's not going right. We're going to help them by putting a little extra pressure back there and go, hey, guys, the, the PowerPoint's not working. Duh, I'm not reading a book here. I know. And they're over there trying to figure it out. And we just overwhelmingly are the beneficiaries of what happens back there. We have a couple of teams of Tima and Peter that we're very grateful for. Jack and Troy are handling things back there this morning. And we're grateful for these guys who take the time to come and prepare and be sure that all these technical things that I barely understand and most of us don't understand. And frankly, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to understand. These guys handle it. But behind the guys who are behind the guys are a couple of guys, Renillo and RJ. And we want to thank them in particular. Renillo, come on up here. RJ, leave your thing for a second. Come on up here, brother. We are really grateful that when things need to be handled, they are handled. And you've heard me say before that so much of this happens behind the scene. Um, that these things that happen behind the scenes, these things happen behind the scenes and behind the walls and in the ceilings. You know that these guys are crawling up in the ceiling to get wiring to go to these projectors, that they're, they're inside the walls some days, it feels like, getting their hands in there so that the wires are running in the right direction. Um, I don't have a clue what you guys do half the time. I just want to know that it works, and it does. And we are particularly so grateful. So far, yeah, see, that's exactly it, right? Yeah, you know, but see, when something doesn't work, and we all look at the back and go, we're going to help you by staring at you, they're actually the ones who make it work. And so we're particularly thankful for these guys. We've got a couple of gifts. I'm going to do something a bit different. I want you to open. Yeah, yeah, I want you to open them now. Yeah, yeah, and I want you to show everybody. Yeah, yeah. What is this? <laughs> oh! Look at this. Wow. Don't raise your <laughs> I do church sound. If you want miracles, ask Jesus. That's what the church say. That's exactly it. We're really thankful. Errol, come on up. And we want to give thanks for these guys, but as they say, behind the scenes. Oh, that's next yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I just said, we're going to work this next Sunday. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Thank you. So where's mine? Where's mine? Yeah. <laughs> you do miracles. I do miracles. <laughs> um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> these guys are good, man. Yeah. Anyhow, can we pray? Father, we thank you for helpers in this church. There are many more people who have done things without anyone knows. We thank you for them. You brought them in our midst. We ask your blessing upon them. We ask you to continue to give them the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge to do what they're doing. As the psalmist says, you rather be a doorkeeper in your house. Mm -hmm. Father, continue to use us, continue to use men of this church and women, and we ask your blessing upon them in everything they do. They never grumble. Lord, we thank you for that, because you always complain. Father, use us as an instrument in your peace mm -hmm. every day of our life. In your name I ask it. Amen. 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 So I'm gonna take this pastor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can have it. Yeah, that's right. Just don't mess up. <laughs> Amen. Um, again, it's always such a blessing to have uh, such such strong leaders, such strong leadership and role models, um, even within my own family. Uh, displaying how much they love the Lord and showing it in different ways and in many ways that we don't even see. Sometimes I don't even see. I'll wake up and my dad is gone and my mom's like, oh, he went to church. He's fixing something there. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so it's just a blessing to have such strong leadership in my family and in the church uh, 
to always inspire the three of us and the rest of the congregation, I'm sure, to strive what we can do to glorify God and to share that with as many people as we can. Um, and in doing that, we will sing the next song, 10,000 Reasons, if the congregation could stand as we sing this next song. <clears throat> Oh, 
Just looking at Andrew's music, that beautiful line that God would work through his word, the word that we are so eager to listen to. As we said, that quote from R.C. Sproul at the beginning of our service was that reality is that we look for power and we look for authority and influence everywhere but the one place that God sometimes has just been so clear to give to us. I know we don't always do that. The reality is that there seems to be something about the efficiency of the word. It's efficient, but it doesn't seem sufficient. It doesn't seem like it's enough sometimes. God has promised us in his word, brothers and sisters, that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness in the scriptures. What a beautiful, beautiful gift. And as we pray, I want you to keep that in mind, that even our prayers flow from the command in the word that we would be constantly praying and seeking to communicate with our Lord. I know there's a number of folks that haven't been well the last while. Pam and I have been battling something for over a month now, and so I want to ask you to continue to pray for folks in terms of their health, uh, both mental health and physical health. This is an odd and a bit of a weird time of year, isn't it? Summer's over. We like the fall, but we know what's next. And sometimes it can be a difficult time for folks. It's a time of adjustment. Children are back in school. Uh, work has started up. All our holidays are done. We're on the other side of Thanksgiving. Now and now is nothing less but Christmas uh, to look forward to. And uh, I want to encourage you to keep that in mind as a church family, as a group of believers. Last night at our games night, we took a minute to pray for uh, Tatiana and Pavlo's family, Gracie's family, uh, young Ivan, her youngest brother, had a severe allergic reaction, had to be rushed to the hospital last night. By God's grace, by the time we were done praying, Tima sent us a text and said he was home and doing okay. Any updates, Gracie? Is he still at home doing okay? Oh, he's here today. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, see, there you go. So God sometimes in his care answers prayer quickly. Uh, and so we are glad for that. So we rejoice in God's provision and God's goodness towards us. As a church family, brothers and sisters, let me encourage you as we go to prayer, do not take gatherings like this for granted. Make, make this just an un, non-negotiable part of your week. But whatever else is happening, just say those things take second place because I gather with God's people on Sunday morning. I don't mean in some kind of rule base, somebody's about to scream legalism. I just mean, what a wonderful habit that we get together every single week. We have such a blessed privilege the freedom in this country to do this, to sing, to pray, to hear from God's word, and to enjoy each other's fellowship. These are unique and beautiful gatherings that by God's grace, it gives us each week. So would you stand, please, and let's pray together. Father, we have been reminded already this morning of how beautiful it is for your people to live, to abide, to dwell together in unity. And we have said before, dear God, that does not mean uniformity. For even you in the Trinity are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet we know, dear God, how easy it is for us to want that. We want unity, which means we want others to be like us. We want people to believe and think, have the same preferences and tastes that we do in so many areas. It shows our weakness, dear God. But it reminds us of the one who meets us in our weakness, the one who promises that his power is made known in our weaknesses, the one who promises sufficient grace, not always removing difficulties, but pouring out and pouring into us grace and mercy that we need, that we might find that we can stand in the face of the temptations of this world, temptations that often look like looking anywhere else but God, that prayer and the Bible reading become the last thing rather than the first thing. Forgive us, dear God, for giving any sense in our lives that your word is efficient to do many things, but it just doesn't seem sufficient for us. Guard us, I pray, dear God, from prayer being a last resort, 
rather than being you being the, the first one that we speak to, that we plead with, that we come to you with our joys as well as our challenges of this life, that we come to you with thanksgiving, eager to do that regularly, not just on a Thanksgiving Sunday, but regularly, dear God, coming to you and acknowledging your kindness and giving our sense of gratitude and gratefulness towards you. We thank you this day, Heavenly Father, you cared for Ivan so quickly, dear God. This young man had this terrible medical challenge, almost, I'm sure, felt like an emergency to the family. And yet by your grace, dear God, you have given such a medical care community here in our province and in our city that it has become your means of grace to his life. We bless you for that, dear God, and even pray as he gives thanks that you yourself would become increasingly precious to him. I'm thankful, Heavenly Father, for our other young people in our church who are about to be dismissed for Sunday school in a moment. We pray, dear God, that you would use the ministry of your word, empowered by your spirit, to again be the fuel for the teaching and the, and the worship end and goal that we have of all teaching, that Christ would be honored and magnified and glorified and made much of and, and just being the one in all the universe that we look to for our security and for our assurance. For our church family at Downs here, dear God, we do not want to take one another for granted. We do not want to take our assembling together with one another for granted. So cause us, dear God, to look forward to such times, to the joy that is evident when we're together. Remind us of that when there are other things and other priorities, other good things that sometimes get in the way of us being here regularly and being able to enjoy the worship of God's people. Yes, not just from a distance, which is legitimate, but dear God, there's just simply no substitute for living the way we've been designed to come together and not neglecting this assembling together of ourselves as some are in the habit of doing. We're our own worst enemies some days, dear God. We know there's so many good things. We can even see them coming from you. But dear God, we ask that you would guard our hearts from loving the gifts rather than the one who has given them to us from loving this creation rather than the creator himself who is blessed forever. Hear our prayer, Heavenly Father, those quiet ones now, those concerns on people's hearts right now that come to mind, those people that pop into each other's heads to think, I remember this person, we were challenged. We were challenged, dear God, to commit ourselves and those that we care about and those situations to, to commit them to you now, dear God to lay them bare before you, that you who are the one who has efficient and sufficient grace coming to your word, that you would be pleased to answer according to your will and according to our needs. We love you, dear Lord. We acknowledge we only do that because you have first loved us. We have made the choice to follow you only because you have decided to cause us to follow you. You've made the choice, dear God, to predetermine that we would be your children. What a glorious truth, dear God. We thank you for that. And we praise you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity that it comes to us now to even say so in worship. Hear our prayer, dear God, even as our children are dismissed now. We ask that you would hear all of our prayers in Christ's name. Amen. As we say, our children are dismissed at this point to be able to go uh, to Sunday school. And you just go straight out the back. And we encourage you that as they are down there, that, the, that as they are being taught, that you remember them and remember those who are willing to teach them as well. On October 31st, 1517, a German monk stood on biblical convictions against the Roman Catholic Church and its leaders. Through this man, a movement was born, a reformation was born, a revolution was born. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. As this monk stood before the church leaders, he planted his feet firmly upon the unchanging truth of God's word and put his life on the line for the sake of the gospel. I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Once eclipsed by a dark cloud of superstition and church politics, the light of the gospel.
gospel began to shine again. The truth was affirmed that mere men are not the agents of reformation, but servants and stewards of God's reformation, of God's word. Throughout the years, the church was reminded that against the steadfast forces of a lost and dying world, faithful men must continually reform according to scripture, always leading the church back to the immovable foundation of the gospel. The old truth that Calvin preached, that Augustine will preach, that Paul will preach, is the truth that I must preach today or else he holds my conscience and my God. From century to century, the battle has raged on. But through the relentless defenders of the gospel message, the church continues to hold her ground. It doesn't mean striking the little one. I don't think it has to be a little one. It means it's us. It means we're judging the one. If we have a mission to be a return to the new testament, that is the only one for us in this present age. Today, the gates of hell continue to wage war on the precious truths brought back into the light in the 16th century. With contemporary challenges arising from within and without the church, the need for reformation is as great now as it ever has been. We must find ourselves on the underside of a moral revolution that practices it in the world. And as long as there are departures and biblical truth, we must continue to reassert the call to faithfulness that was famously proclaimed 500 years ago. Until Jesus comes again, the Reformation is never over. The church must be, and must always be, performed according to the Word of God. October is Reformation Month. That is the month that we remember <clears throat> on the 31st of October. 1517 was the day that this Augustinian monk named Martin Luther nailed his protest to seek to reform the church of the day, to reform it according to the word of God. Reform, reformation did not mean splitting the church, did not mean desiring of starting a new church, but recovering the truth of the gospel back to the central place that it must have amongst the people of God. And so when you think this, this month and it's fall and Halloween is coming and all these exciting things that are happening, remember, brothers and sisters, that this is a month that we mark the time that God was pleased through this man and dozens and dozens of others and dozens and dozens of other martyrs who gave their life, killed because they wanted to own and distribute copies of God's word throughout Europe. We are the heirs. We have Bibles upon Bibles upon Bibles in our homes, don't we? We have them on our bookshelves. Some of them are a little more dusty than maybe we wish they would, would be. God, we want to be those who are simply Bible people. And that our church in particular would constantly not just have expository preaching, exit, the expository, that means out of the text, but an expository ministry that everything we do would be passed through the filter of the word of God, such that by God's grace, we would be those who, as Paul tells his servant Timothy, that we would guard this good deposit. And so with that in mind, I want to encourage you, please, to take your Bibles and turn as we continue our letter, our series in the book of Ephesians. But before you turn to Ephesians, I want you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy. And we're doing this because last week, as we began our series in the book of Ephesians, we did so in Acts chapter 20. And now we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the reason we're doing that is I want us to come to grips very early with the extraordinarily relational character of this book. I know that the book of Ephesians is full of heavy duty and glorious doctrine. And yet it is a book that was written by the Apostle Paul when he was imprisoned because of his commitment to this word. In Acts chapter 20 last week, we saw that Paul, as far as he knew, the Holy Spirit was telling him he was going from this port city of Miletus, eventually to Jerusalem, eventually to Rome, and eventually to the grave. 
None of those, none of you among whom I have preached the word of God, Paul says, will ever see my face again. And he knelt down on that beach and they cried and prayed together. The elders of the church from Ephesus. Those are the ones that Paul in his last hours wanted to desperately be part of. And here today we come to the person who is essentially the pastor of this church at Ephesus. You remember the Apostle Paul went from Acts chapter 20 eventually to prison and from prison wrote the church at Ephesus. And after he was at, at least escaped from his first imprisonment, he writes to the one who was his chief disciple, the man who in whom he wanted to place his kind word and his ministry, this young man, Timothy, who Paul left at Ephesus on one of his missionary journeys and now writes back here for the second time to encourage this young man. Again, very emotional, but very relational. So that you understand as we walk through the book of Ephesians that it is coming from the heart of a man who loved these people, who was loved by these people, and is desperately eager that they would indeed fall in love deeper and deeper with the Lord Jesus Christ. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, again, you see that on your pew Bibles, 994 or page 1181. When I say these books are 2 Timothy, there's a 2 in the front of it. That means it's the second time that Paul the Apostle wrote to this man, Timothy, when the large numbers, number one, when I say chapter one, that's the large number you see. And the smaller numbers there are verses one to 14. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, as we read 2 Timothy chapter one. I will read the first 14 verses. This is what Holy Scripture says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Verse 6, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel for which I was appointed a teacher, a preacher, and an apostle and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Please have your seats, friends.
In, in this beautiful letter, the book of Ephesians, you hear the Apostle Paul say what? I want you to guard this good deposit, but this good deposit is something that is going to be connected to those that you are ministering. If you will what? Fan into flame the gift of God which you have within you. He's saying, I want you to, to nourish this flame, if you will. I want you to feed this flame. I want you to throw fuel on this flame. I want you to be so passionate and convicted that this is what the people at the church of Ephesus need. And here's the glorious truth that the Apostle Paul is going to lay out in the first chapter of his letter back to this church. The church, which is pastored by this young man, Timothy, it's this truth. Our sovereign God has not left the salvation of his people in the hands of sinners. Now, is that not good news? Our sovereign God has not left the salvation of his people in the hands of sinners like me. No, no. He is determined that he would do all of this to the praise of his glory, that he would be the one who would determine, who would bring about to the pleasure and praise of his own glory, all that he has planned for us as his own. And that, brothers and sisters, <coughs> excuse me, ought to be a fuel for our worship. These truths should be like gasoline poured straight from the pump onto the flames, as it will, that are being fanned into flame onto our lives, onto the passion that we should and must have for the gospel of the Lord Jesus. As I said, you can hear as we read 2 Timothy chapter 1, my, my child, I long to see you. I would be filled with joy. My son in the faith, he calls Timothy. This is a highly relational letter. And as he is pouring out these truths that we're about to see today, it comes to us as fuel for our worship here. I didn't ask the ladies to sing it today, but I, I could have just thought about a singing. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. We, we, we pull together one another. We want to share the things that we are passionate about. C.S. Lewis said that praise is joy's appointed consummation. That we love to praise the things that we love. And these truths that we're going to continue to see, we ought to love. And they ought to be a fuel for us to worship. Not just words for controversy or even words to just be correct. No, no, that we would be fueled to worship the king who has come in our place like this. And I want us to focus in particular today on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Let me read them to you, and then you can turn there in a moment. But the Apostle Paul writes this to this church. In him, that is in Jesus, we, listen to this great truth, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things, all things, the Apostle Paul says, work in accordance with his counsel. To the end that, verse 12, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise, the praise of his glory. That is why God does what he does. That we as the people of God who would own this inheritance according to his determination to give it to us would be to the praise of his glory. That is how in this very relational and emotional letter, that is what Paul says is God's goal in what God is doing. That we would be as God's people to the praise of his glory. So here's the imperative. All our application is front-loaded today. We're about to look at the text. But here's what I want you to go home with. Here's the imperative. Here's the action word. Downsview Baptist Church, praise God. Praise God. That's the, that's the verb. Praise him. Why? Praise him that our inheritance is secure. Since, or why, or because, because our God works all things according to his will. That's a beautiful truth that ought to fuel our worship throughout this service and indeed throughout our week to come. Praise God, Downsview.
that your inheritance in Christ is secure. And it is secure because God works all things according to his will. This inheritance we have, we have an inheritance that is in accordance with the purpose, the plan, and the pleasure of God. Yeah, I know I tend to rhyme words, but each of those are right there in the text. You're going to see them this morning, that he does all of these things to the ultimate praise and glory of his grace. So if you haven't turned there yet, please turn in Ephesians. It's on page 978 or page 1159. Let's go back a couple of books. To Ephesians chapter 1. As I said, we will concentrate in particular on verse 11 and 12 today. Now, I want to make one definition here. Where it says inheritance, chapter 1, verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Okay? The inheritance there. Is, is a parallel or a synonym for our salvation. Let me tell you why that is. It says there in verse 3 that we have obtained this inheritance. What is this inheritance? Well, what it is, it is what those who have, verse 12, hoped in Christ have. This inheritance comes because we are the ones who hoped in Christ. And I think you would agree that those who have their hopes set in Christ are those who are saved. So when I use the term inheritance, as we read through it here today, I am paralleling that where it is a synonym for our salvation, our right standing, our place be for the Lord, holy and adopted as his people. Guarantee that one day we will be Him with him forever. So inheritance is those who hope in God those who hope in God are saved. So inheritance means our salvation. Three things I want you to praise God for today, John Zoo. Number one, the purpose. Number one, the purpose that God has in our salvation. And it is put this way. Our sovereign God has purposed his salvation of his people. Our sovereign God has purposed our salvation as his people. Again, chapter 1 and verse 11, this is how he puts it. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, listen now, according to the purpose, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God has purposed that we would be his. God has determined with a goal in mind that we would be his people. Praise God for that. Praise God, this is not something arbitrary. Praise God, this is not something that was sort of a, a plan B. Oh, gee, I had Adam in the garden, and then he blew it, and he and Eve had to be cast out. What do I, what do, I do now? And, and God brings his people together, and then uh, before you know it, every thought of man was wicked. And so I've got to come with the flood during Noah's time, and, and I'm going to start again another race afterwards. And, and then, you know, the people of God continually are angry again and again and again with God, and and, and he wants to, he's going to just have to start all over again. In fact, Moses actually says, why don't you just wipe this all out and start all over again? No, 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 friends. God's salvation of his people. God's eternal purpose in grace is just that. It is something that was eternally decreed. The text actually said in chapter one last week, as we saw, before the foundation of the world, the father chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. Before any of these things happen, before you or I made one wrong decision, before any of us blew it in our own idolatries and giving in the temptation, before any of that, God purposed to save us. One brother pastor puts it this way. The Apostle Paul assures the Ephesian believers of their inheritance by reminding them again that God has predestined them to possess it. Just as believers were predestined for adoption according to the purpose of his will, chapter 1, verse 5, so here they are predestined to receive an inheritance according to the purpose of him who works all things 
according to the counsel of his will. Praise God, because God has a purpose in mind for you. The second thing to praise God for is the plan. And the plan is articulated this way. Our sovereign God has secured the salvation of his people by not just purposing it, not just have a goal or an aim in mind, but then he has a plan. You know what this is like. Okay, I'm determined we're going to go on holidays to Europe next year. That's my purpose. Now what do I have to do? I have to find plane fare. I have to find accommodation. I have to find somewhere to leave the dog. Got to have something to do with the kids. What am I going to do at work? I've got to make sure they understand. We've got to have the alarm turned off and the water turned off. There's all hundreds of things you have to do before you go on a long trip. That your purpose is to go. Your plan is doing everything required to bring it about. We should praise God because he purposed to save us. And we should praise God because then he had a plan for it. That's there in verse 11 again. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined. That means to plan in advance. In fact, it means to plan, to bring about a plan in advance. Predetermine that we're going on this trip, to finish my analogy. Or in this case, predetermine that our inheritance will indeed be ours. Praise God that he is determined to do that. And he can do that because, as it says, this predestination is according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That the Lord who's purposed it is the Lord who's planned it. And we praise God that he's purposed and that he's planned it. And thirdly, I want you to praise him for this down to you, the pleasure God takes in doing this. You put it this way. Our sovereign God has both the ambition and the ability to bring about this plan. Some, some, sometimes we can get caught up with two of three key aspects of God. That he's loving enough to save us, that he's powerful enough to save us, and that he's wise enough to know how to do it. Every once in a while we have this picture of God who's very loving. He wants to save us. He's, he's wise. He knows how to do it. Ah, but after all, he's impotent. He's in power. He doesn't have enough power to do it. He'd love to. He knows what needs to be done, but he doesn't have the power. Or you have a God who's incredibly all-powerful. And he's a God who's wise beyond measure, knows exactly what we need. But eh, he's not really that interested in saving us. He doesn't love us. He doesn't have any desire for that. Or he desires to save us. And he is powerful to do all things. But at the end of the day, he's just too stupid to know how to do it. Now, I know nobody says exactly that. But there's times, brothers and sisters, that there's just something lacking in God. And we betray that because we want to offer ourselves in place. Just a little bit of my plan here, God. Just a little bit of my own correction for you. Just, you know, God, if you do it just a little quicker. Yeah, you answered that prayer pretty quickly. Really glad to see you, Ivan. Very glad to see you, brother. Just a little answered prayer sitting right there in the pew. But there's a sense sometimes that, God, you know, you could have answered a little more quickly. Or, you know, you answered, but not quite the way it should have been done. And prayer becomes an instructing of God. You ever find yourself there? God, what you should do is this, or you should do it this way, or in this timing. And yet you have a God who is perfectly loving, all-powerful, and absolutely wise. And that's where this third point comes in, that it is God's pleasure because he has both the ability and the ambition, the desire, to bring about this plan of salvation. It says it there in verse 12. So that we have this inheritance, we have it, and God is saving us so that, in order that, we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. That God would be pleased to do this. In fact, Psalm 115 verse 3 says exactly that. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. You know what that's like. I, 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 I'm not sure I want to do what God wants. I just want to do as I please. I remember one of our friends back in Sault Ste. Marie used to say, if it pleases you, 
to please God, you may do as you please. If it pleases you to please God, you may do as you please. It's true. If that's what we're doing. But God is always pleased at what God is up to. God is pleased to give us his inheritance. It's not because we're begging for it. And he doesn't want to. We have to somehow pry his fingers loose of this gift to get it to us. No, no. Praise God for his purpose to save. Praise God for his plan to save. And praise God that he finds pleasure in doing exactly that for us. But I know that it's at this point some of us can find ourselves a little bit confused. I don't mean insulting confused. I mean we've got things over here about God that seem right. We've got things over here that seem true. And they, they don't seem to fit together. We, we don't quite understand how this all works. Because there seem to be these monumental truths that the Apostle Paul is articulating here. That he has a purpose and a plan and takes pleasure in giving us this inheritance of securing it for us, of guaranteeing our salvation. There's a part of us, isn't there? That we actually have come to think that we are saved by deciding to follow Jesus. That the cause of being in a right position with Jesus is a decision I make. That the, the cause itself, that the decision itself is the actual thing that makes me or constructs for me a place of salvation before the Lord. And I'm saying it's a bit confusing because some of you are looking at the screen and going, that seems exactly right. Aren't, aren't we saved? Because we decided to follow Jesus? Think of it this way, friends. We must decide to follow Jesus in order to be saved. Amen? Yes? We got a Bible verse in your mind? Can you think of one? Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Anyone, Romans 10 says, who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved will be saved. You ask Jesus to save you, he's going to save you. You never ask him to save you, you're not going to be saved. So we're saved by deciding to follow Jesus. Not quite. We must decide to follow Jesus, but deciding to follow him does not save us. What is the cause of our salvation in Christ? What is the cause of our salvation in Christ? Is it our decision to follow Jesus? Is it our decision that saves us? Friends, Jesus saves us. That's the cause. He is the cause. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the one that it says has done what he's done giving us this and securing this inheritance in accordance with or according to the purpose of Jesus. It's his purpose, not my works, not my efforts, not my prayers and, and my faithful living, all things that we should do, frankly, things we must do. No, no, we're not giving our inheritance in accordance with us, but in accordance with, according to his purpose. Jesus decided to save you. Talk about fuel for worship, friends. Yes, you decided to follow him, but he decided to save you when you follow him. That's the, that's the case. Jesus is the one. This decision connects you to the Savior. Jesus has decided to follow you. He says there in verse 11 again, think it through. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined. God decided before you decided that you would be his child. How is that not great news? Before the foundation of the world, it said, the Father chose you, the Son redeemed you, and the Spirit sealed you, we saw last week. Jesus has determined before you decided that he would save you. That's what he says in verse 5, isn't it? He has predestined us, 
predetermined, planned, and brought it about in advance, what? Predestined us to adoption to himself. He has decided he would take us into his family as his sons in a place of privilege and prominence, not the servants in the back, but just as that picture of the prodigal son. No, 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 you're not going to be a servant. You're going to be treated like my son. Heirs of the promises of God, heirs of Christ. Extraordinary way that God himself speaks about us. That we've been predestined according to him through Jesus Christ according to, again, the purpose of his will. He purposed to save you and I. It was his purpose to save you. And Jesus then made a plan to save you. Friends, it is all done to the praise of his glory. All the praise and the glory to God, well, some of the praise? Does he get some of the praise? Well, he gets most of the praise at least, right? I had to decide. That maybe he gets almost all the praise. 99.999% of the praise. What do you think? Isn't, isn't there just a little left over for me? Just a little commendation? Just a little pat on the back? Just a little out of boy, Pete. You made the right decision and that person didn't. Is there just a little bit left over for me? Brothers and sisters, our inheritance is ours according to the purpose of him. According to the counsel of his will. Not according to my works or even my right decisions to follow him. Faith does not save you. Jesus saves you. Faith connects you to the Savior. It is a gracious thing that God gives us faith that connects us to the Savior. It is always Jesus who saves, which is why he is the one who gets the glory, working all things according to the counsel. Counsel of his will. Counsel, instruction, words of determination. The counsel of his will. Again, we may find ourselves a little mixed up with this truth and, and that truth. I, I, I know. I do get this, friends. I've been working through this for 30 years as a pastor. This may be new and fresh to some of us. But know how safe you are, friends, by just wrapping your arms around these beautiful scriptures. Because in doing so, you're wrapping your arms around the very means by which Jesus prayed you'd be like him. Father, make them holy by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Don't leave us alone, his disciples say. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to lead you into all that truth. Sometimes there's a bit of confusion. And sometimes a bit of confusion because we're reading this text and go, it, it doesn't seem quite right. I know the Bible says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right. We sing, God does all things well. But if he does, I'm not sure how to square this with everything else I've heard about God. Before we know it, we actually tend to believe that we can tell God a little something about fairness and about justice and about what's right, don't we? That doesn't seem fair. It doesn't quite seem right. Lord, that, that, that doesn't... And we, we're helping God out in these moments, right? Trying to get God off the hook. That, that doesn't seem quite right. That paints God in a different picture. So, so it's, it's not God that's doing something wrong. Maybe the preacher's saying something wrong. That's a wrong interpretation. And we're tempted along that line, brothers and sisters, because there's, there's something that doesn't seem to connect here. Let me see if I can help. He said he works all things 
according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Who's the guy in the Bible? I suppose there's certainly more than one example. Who's the guy in the scriptures who started out fighting for the angels, standing on the promises of God, fighting for his word against those who would assault him, and then slipped into this self-dependent sinfulness because of believing his own counsel over the counsel of God. Who's the guy? Isn't it at least one of the guys was Job? Who after chapter 13 of the, of the book of Job, though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. And then Job started asking questions and then started issuing challenges and then started spouting blasphemies that God, you afflict me without a cause, that you do things you ought not to do. I would speak with the Almighty. He will answer to me. God shows up in Job chapter 38. What does he say? The Lord answered Job out of this whirlwind, and he said, Who is this that darkens counsel without words of knowledge? See the connection there? God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and God says to Job, It sounds like it's the counsel of your will that you want me to do things with. And so this challenge ends up with what? Listen, dress for action like a man. I love the King James here. Gird up thy loins like a man, right? Pull up your boots. Stand on your feet, literally. I will question you, and you will make known to me. Oh, man alive. Can you imagine? The Lord of heaven and earth, who you've been beacon off about that you know better than, and he shows up. He says, tell you what, how about you answer me a question or two, Job? And he goes from chapter 38 all the way through chapter 41. Where were you when I did? Can you do the things I've done? Who has done the things that you see? Will you be able to do? Where were you when I created the mountains? Can you pull up Leviathan from the sea? Can you actually make the sun make its orbit around the sky? Can you actually create from almost nothing what I have created? And God goes again and again and again to Job from chapter 38 all the way through chapter 41. Take the time to read it in a sitting one time, friends. In the middle of it, God, Job breaks in and goes, um, okay, I've had enough. God's like, no, no, no. Gird up your loins like a man. Stand on your feet. Listen, I'll ask you. You give me your counsel. <coughs> all the way through Chapter 42, where Job, who was relying on his own counsel, what does he say? Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, no purpose. Purpose, plan, and pleasure. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Sounds like chapter 1, verse 11, doesn't it? Who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And no purpose of yours can be thwarted, Job says. I know that now. And he repeats and quotes God back to himself. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Uh, that'd be me, Job says. Who is it that speaking when he should have been listening? Who is it that is talking about things that he did not understand? Who is it that thinks God's not fair? God's not doing right. That's just not just. That doesn't square with my vision of you. Job says, I was the one who hid counsel without knowledge. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful to me. Things that I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you'll make known to me. That's what God said to Job. Job's thinking, well, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. Now I'm listening. Now I get it. Therefore, I despise myself. I hate what I've said. 
I deplore the foolishness that's come out of my mouth. I despise my own counsel, my own opinion that somehow God ought to answer to me. I despise myself and I repent. I retract. I stop. I beg your forgiveness. I repent in sath glass or in dust and ashes. Job says, I know no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Paul says, you work everything according to the purpose of the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Can I put it this way? Just bring it home a little bit. Was the cross of Christ an accident? Whoops. God didn't know. Well, God did know, but God just lets things happen. God doesn't make difficult things happen. He just allows them and permits them. Does that mean the cross of Christ was an accident, you think? Well, the testimony of Scripture would say very different, wouldn't it? Acts chapter 2. Apostle Peter is now preaching. This Jesus, how was he delivered up? According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified by the hands of lawless men. You kill, crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. The cross happened because God purposed and planned, you ready? And took pleasure. What does Isaiah 53 say? It pleased the Lord to bruise him, putting him to death. God, God is not taking pleasure in the torture of his son and the death of his son itself. He was taking pleasure in the sacrifice that was acceptable to him for the sins of sinners like you and I. It's a cross an accident. Acts chapter 2 says that. Acts chapter 4. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy, holy servant Jesus. Who? Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and along with the people of Israel. They the reason the cross happened? They were there to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God is never off the throne, brothers and sisters. He is never off the throne in your life. He is not lazy. He is not tardy. He is not half good. He is not one who can't be depended on or only in other situations. Dear friends, you can depend on this God who works all things. Yes, even that thing. What you're dealing with this morning, dealing all those things, are working according to the counsel of his will. So we can leave here singing blessed assurance as we did earlier to praise God that this inheritance we have is secure since our God works all things according to his will. Brothers and sisters, he does that ultimately. Why? the praise of his glorious grace. This is why God does what he does, so that he might be glorified, even in the midst of my confusion, even because of the clarity he brings me in his word, but as this is rest on the promises of our sovereign God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's our great joy even in the confusion sometimes of these truths, for the clarity of mercy and grace to just break through. We praise you for your purpose to save us. We praise you for a plan conducted in order to save us. We praise you for the pleasure you take, not just in the death and resurrection of your son, but in the fruit of such efforts, the salvation the eternal inheritance guaranteed by the plan, the purpose, because of the pleasure of the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We praise you, Heavenly Father. Holy God, holy and lifted up. 
holy and eternally good, holy and eternally committed to his own glory. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would guard us from any moment of sliding away from believing you are loving, powerful, and wise enough to work all things according to the counsel of your will. Remind us of the example of Job. Cause us, Heavenly Father, I pray, to put our hands over our mouths. We have spoken about things too wonderful for us. We, dear God, want to bow our knee to the revelation of King Jesus and that you, Heavenly Father, would be the one to cause us to rejoice in the fact that our sovereign God has not left our salvation in the hands of sinners like us. He is determined to save and save us to the uttermost. What a holy and righteous God you are, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Your name is the greatest, your name. 
praise you for the reality that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. The salvation, the inheritance that is ours by grace cannot be snatched away. You have paid for it by the very blood of your own veins, poured out as a currency with which you have redeemed your people. We praise you, dear God, and we pray that we would join our voices throughout this day with the angels. Cause us not to forget these truths as we leave here. Cause us to revel in them, dear God. Cause us, I pray, Heavenly Father, to be those who are eager to honor your son's name throughout this day. You are the one who is holy.